True Hoop. I'm Henry Abbott, and today, special guest, Jack McCallum. How are you, sir? I'm okay, Henry, I guess. But you always say every guest is special, I'm guessing, right? No, no, we definitely have some pretty ordinary <laughs> guests. Yeah, yeah. No, this okay. is a special day. I, is this is your 12th book? Is that right? Well, it is my 12th. I, it's according to how many you actually acknowledge. I've written 12. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> I, no, I'm kidding. I've written 12. I acknowledge eight or nine, but no, I'm just kidding. No, they they were all fun in their own way. Yes, it is. Even doesn't. So you kind of have this down. Like you have a routine. You kind of know how to do it. Um, do you feel like you're on, on top of your game here? Yeah. I feel like I'm on top of my game. Yes, of course. I wouldn't say anything else. I think that's true. The, the writing, uh, this is going to come out sounding wrong. I'm not saying the writing gets easier. The, the writing a book isn't what I worry about. And I think you kind of know this too. Putting it together is the fun part. And if you don't get better at that, I mean, we should have gotten out of our respective professions. It's the reporting. It's mm -hmm. the gathering of information that are true variables. I mean, do you get everybody? Uh, do you get them in a place where they can talk? Do you get them trusting you? Do you get them when they're watch not watching uh, television or something? So the gathering of the information for any kind of book, whatever you're doing, in my opinion, uh, is the rough part. When you're sitting alone and you got your stuff, uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm old, man, but I don't see any reason I couldn't be doing that 10 years from now. If I suddenly forgot, you know, start forgetting what a, what a key does, I guess, you know, then maybe I should get out. <laughs> but the variable, the variable, uh, the, the reporting is the variable yeah. to me. It's not really the writing. The writing is what uh, you can count on, my opinion. Okay, so the book you just published is called The Real Hoosiers. Um, we're going to talk about that, but I'm just guessing because it's 2024 and books take a long time to write that you had to do a lot of this reporting over like Zoom. Is that right? Uh, well, I work not really. The, one of the okay. things about this book that is different from uh, most other books I've done is that a lot of people were gone <laughs> oh. or as they say in india indiana i'd call up well is he still around well he passed oh. <laughs> you know, so, so he can't talk is what you're saying he's not going to he help passed. out yeah he passed okay. so to a certain extent there was a more uh limited number of people i always uh jeff perlman's a friend of mine mm -hmm. and jeff is always posting well he's one of the ordinary guests we've had by the way he would count as a <laughs> More I just interviewed. <laughs> I just interviewed my 681st person for the two pack book. You know, I'm, that's probably literally a number that's true. And I'm going now. Mm, I didn't interview I that many people. There are very few members of Oscars. Uh, we're going to talk about Christmas Attic basketball team. Yeah, a lot of people are gone. A lot of people from the basketball team are gone. So to to a greater extent than in other books, when everybody was pretty much alive. Uh, it's a lot more uh, book, you know, resource material, uh, newspapers.com, old mm -hmm. Indianapolis Recorder, which was the great African-American newspaper in Indianapolis. It's still going on. So there's a lot more history type of work than it would be uh, interviewing type of stuff. There were certainly, you know, dozens and dozens of interviews, but a lot of history type of stuff for this one, Henry. So it's called the real Hoosiers because the fake Hoosiers are the ones that they made a movie about, kind of right? Is that that's what we're kind of poking I, fun at there a little? It was out. It was there, and I've yeah, since yeah. had a, a email exchange with Angelo Pizzo, who wrote Hoosiers, and who oh, was oh. who was a uh, we're not close friends, but I've known Angelo for I think it was about twenty years ago for Sports Illustrated. I went out and did a. Uh, 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 like every other sports writer does a story about sports movies. Mm -hmm. And Angelo wrote not only Hoosiers, but also Rudy. Oh, and like I, a in a class that I taught at Muhlenberg College, of which Henry Abbott was a guest at least two years, I recall, 
I, I still meet your look. kids, by the way. I still meet those kids. I out in my life, someone's like, oh, I went to Muhlenberg. I saw you in Jack's class. Like, it still happens. Well, you mean they're waiting on you at Sears, or what are they? What are they? <laughs> no, no, they're CEOs and they're <laughs> yeah, airline pilots. Yeah, <laughs> there, there you go, there you go. So Angelo actually came into my class. So Angelo sent me an email that said, uh, "Well, I haven't read the book yet. My friends are uh, wondering if this was an in-your-face kind of dig <laughs> at the Hoosiers." I said, "No, it was an appreciation of the iconic nature of the film and how." When you talk about a uh, Hoosier, you're talking pretty much about the movie Hoosiers. That's yeah. and Angelo did have a few problems with the chapter that I wrote in there specifically about the movie. But I said, look, man, uh, people are going to be watching that movie a hundred years from now. I yeah. mean, be happy, dude. <laughs> you know, be, yeah, that's, be a happy. Win. that's a win. That's a win. It's a win. One of the, it's like a McDonald's putting up a hundred billion sold. You won. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Bat, the battle's over, man. You know. I've had and so many of, conversations where like sports writers are like, oh, well, someone made a mean comment on my story. And I'm like, yeah. And Brad Pitt, like every movie he's ever been in, <laughs> like whoever the most successful person in the world is, whoever that is to you, like they have that comment too. You know, like that's like, <laughs> it's fine. But it's just fine. We've, we've done that though, right? I bet you've done, people have written, I bet a profile about you. And you've gone to the one thing in the story yeah, and, and kind of went, I remember somebody at my local newspaper did a story about me and, uh, you know, halfway through it, they made a comment like McCallum uh, nervously clawed at his socks. And I'm going, <laughs> what? I don't <laughs> think you did that. I, I, yeah, I'm not nervous. You know, under the maybe, withering glare of the Bethlehem, whatever the paper's called, yeah, the, uh, the Allentown Morning Call, as a matter of go. fact. Okay, you know. okay. So uh, I, and apparently, <laughs> since that was about thirty years ago, evidently I've never forgotten that. <laughs> so that's how we are, man. That's what we do. It's just how we do. But if I'm your friend and you say that, then I have to be like Jack for crying out loud. Like you gotta get over this nervous sock thing, right? You do your role, I'll do mine. Um, Okay, so 1954, the movie's about uh, the Milan team, which is the famous star of the movie, white team, beats the Crispus Attucks team. They're actually pronounced, believe it or not, Milan. Oh, they I never knew Milan. That. Yeah, they are okay. They wanted to get away from any Italian yeah, 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 yeah. restaurant to it. You know? If they were Venice, it would have been Venice, I guess. But they are, <laughs> they are Milan High School from uh, a small high school. Yes. Okay. And then, but the, but the, but your story starts with, with Crispus Attucks, the team that they beat in the final, went on to win the next two state championships. And it's a special school with a special story and Oscar Robertson and this guy, Ray Crow, I didn't know anything about. Um, can you kind of tell us a little bit about how you got into this? Well, I was doing it was during the pandemic. And, uh, you know, I was it was not only grounded by the pandemic, but I was uh, rehabbing a knee replacement. Oh, and uh, I just started researching. Uh, I, I wanted to do something different. I understand the second sentence of my obituary, if anybody bothers to write it, will be that I, you know, wrote the dream team and that I covered those guys. But I, I just... Because the first sentence will be about seven seconds or less. Is that why you say that? No, <laughs> probably not. It's probably... I, gonna, I, book. <laughs> I know you did. And I would have... <laughs> seven seconds or less, I will never get another chance to uh, to write a book like that. And not many people not many people will. So I'm always in, indebted to it. But Dream Team is kind of, you know, the most people bought it, we'll put it that way, and are yeah. still buying it because they they, they knew the guys. You know, yeah. there was no secret to it. Anyway, so I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to do what I call Michael Magic Larry, you know, one word, Michael Magic Larry, that whole era. And I was started to research other things. And believe it or not, I came upon this. I came upon the idea of researching you won't believe this. I started researching lynching in the oh. United States. Okay. Completely unbelievably ugly topic. And there was a lynching in Indiana. There's really not enough time to go into it, but there's a chapter in the book about it. And uh, it happened in 1930. Four years before that, the team that had won the state championship, Marion High School, famous, you know, uh, 
Zach Randolph's from uh, from mm -hmm. Marion years later, obviously. They celebrated in the times in the town square in 1926 when they won the championship. Four years later, they had a lynching in the same town square and with an equally joyous celebration. Terrible story. The picture from that lynching is the one that inspired Billie Holiday's song, Strange, Strange Fruit. Fruit. It's probably the second most famous uh, lynching picture compared to Emmett Till and his casket. Anyway, I said, well, this would be an amazing book. And I started thinking about it and talking to people. And it was like, why do we need Jack McCallum white explaining the history of lynching? And I talked to a number of my African-American writing friends about it. Nobody. It was a bad time. Pandemic, George Floyd. And it was just all too. Why the F would I do this? They, they, it's, I'm not the right guy. It's not the right book. And during researching this, I came upon a number of other things, being the Christmas Addicts book. And I'm going to say, yeah, okay, if I'm going to white explain history to everybody, at least I got, it's a basketball history book. It's Oscar. It's a subject I know. Uh, I grew up watching Oscar. I grew up playing basketball in the 1950s. I, I get this material. You know, I kind of get it. And it was just such more of a, I don't, I do not want to use the word uplifting, but let's use the word a more nuanced type of story that better fit my, uh, better fit my abilities that I, I would say. That's how I kind of came upon it. We did get in this thing, that moment you're describing, um, the summer of the BLM protest, like it, sports felt kind of dumb, right? Like it felt a little bit not we weren't getting enough marrow in the stories if we kept the stories like they always were. Does that make sense? Like it, I understand your urge here, like why you'd be Googling the way you were Googling. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was a still a kind of reckoning. I mean, I still think about it a little bit. And I still think if I was a everyday journalist, which I'm, you know, covering a team, could I really think about things. And I know in your, in, on your website and your podcast, you do go into other things. And I'm not saying you do that because of COVID, but certainly I think any journalist came upon some kind of reckoning back in, in 2020 that, well, let's, if, if we pretended this was the most important stuff in the world before, let's not do it now. You know, I, I do think there was kind of that permanent accounting, but I do feel fortunate that I was a little bit older and I was kind of out of everyday journalism now, because if I had to tweet, uh, you know, uh, OKC up by four at halftime every night, uh, I, I, I really just don't think I could do it anymore. However, that's the job. That's the job of some people. We still love sports. One of the things we found out during that time was, you remember that when the Michael documentary came along, Henry, and it was during another shutdown, and you can say what you want about the documentary, whether you liked it or not, but that was really kind of a national conversation for a while that held a lot of people together. I was going through my, my rehab then for the knee, and, uh, you know, I just, every time we would do it, there would be a cluster of people, not just because I covered them and knew them, but because that's what people were talking about. And that really struck me. Uh, that moment kind of uh, stayed with me for a long yeah. time. And it still is, I think. TV has never been more important, right? Like, I, I, I'm not a huge TV fan, to be honest. But like during the lockdown, it was like, OK, if you got some good TV, that is super important. right? I watched the Tiger King every second. I just you know, that's not something I would ordinarily do, but it was a different time. It was. and certainly the. The Michael documentary hit a giant home run in that, that period. Yep. Um, okay, so I met Oscar Robertson in 2001 when Alan Iverson was like glowing with just a radiant energy. And there was this guy standing in the Sixers locker room who I was like, I think that's Oscar Robertson, right? Um, and he was just standing there in a, in a gray suit. And I, was, um, I just went, I was like, hey, you know, like I introduced myself and and, you know, he sure enough was Oscar. And I was like, you know, what, just kind of curious, like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm just hoping to talk to 
Alan. And he just waited patiently for everyone who wanted a piece of Alan Iverson. He just waited. And then he kind of went over and talked for 30 seconds. And I was like, man, this is like, and then I don't know. I, then I walked out to the media section and I forget who I talked to, but someone, and I was like, you know, I, was like, I just met Oscar Robertson and he just was waiting his turn to talk to, to, to kiss the ring of Alan Iverson. Right. And, um, whoever talked to me, he's like, oh yeah, he's kind of difficult. Like he's got a reputation as being kind of prickly. And I just, I, and I, I've never really known much more about Oscar than that, but now is my chance, right? So can you tell me a little bit more about your experience of Oscar? Well, number one, Oscar wouldn't, uh, I probably in the past have used the word, I may have used the word difficult, same time that I've used other words that I regret. I mean, the longer we're in this game, you do learn some shit, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I probably have used that, certainly have used the word uh, prickly, which is an unfortunate word, but sort of maybe gets to the matter more than, uh, more than difficult, because difficult sounds like there's no nuance to it. Well, Oscar um, grew up very, very difficult circumstances. That is sort of the essence of this book. And feels that weight went to Cincinnati, where he felt the weight of racism there, went to the Cincinnati Royals, where he felt the weight of not quite being, well, never winning it, always banging his head against the Celtics, ends up being coached by Bob Cousy, sort of the opposite end of the point guard (laughs) (laughs) argument. Mm-hmm. Finally goes to Milwaukee, wins a championship uh, for the for the first and only time with Kareem. So for whatever variety of reasons, Oscar never got, either never wanted to be completely integrated, I'm using that in a non-race uh, sense, integrated into the NBA, or they never wanted him. But what you have to look at, Henry, is the difference between him and Jerry West. West and Robertson came into the league exactly the same way Magic and Bird did. I mean, they were one and two. They came in together in 1960. They had a connection more than Magic and Larry, who played in the final game. Jerry and Oscar co-captained the 1960 Olympic team. They come into the league. Oscar's number one. Jerry's number two. Oscar's a star right away. Jerry takes some time. But from the moment they came into the league in 1960, Jerry, who I'm sure you've met, you know, who who hasn't met Jerry, has never been away from the league (laughs) for like, what's that, 64 years. And Oscar has never really been integrated into it. And you can say that that is, I think it is partly, I'm stating this now because I stated it in the book. I think it is partly Oscar's fault. I wish he were late to, uh, I wish he were ready to forgive past faults a little bit easier. I wish that he were be able, that he would be able to not see a kind of dark motive with everybody. But who am I, you know, haven't walked in the man's shoes. Somebody told me from one of the Stanley Warren, who's an academic who still lives in Indianapolis, Purdue University professor, went to Christmas Attics High School, played on the team with Oscar, says, Oscar's pissed off and he's got a lot to be pissed off about. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't, you know, the old suffer fools greatly, you know, gently. He doesn't do that. He doesn't forget. So I figured when I started this book that Oscar would probably, uh, not quote cooperate with me and i tried eight or nine times and finally politely wrote back and said uh i uh you know i will not be a part of your project you know good luck talk to his teammates who are still alive from christmas addicts high school um they wish that oscar had embraced the whole idea of christmas addicts years ago and maybe they'd be rich from a movie uh but 
they don't want to go too far out on that ledge because nobody would know who the hell they were right. if it wasn't for Oscar Robertson. So my ultimate rationalization for Oscar not talking to me, and you know we have to rationalize in this game, is that <laughs> I didn't want to do an Oscar biography. That, I, that isn't what I was looking to do. So in a way, when you have to write around someone, uh, you know, you, you hope that it makes it a little more nuanced. You hope it makes it a little richer. And I, I hope that that is what uh, people come away with uh, in this book. So talk to me about Crispus Attucks. Well, it was Crispus Attucks. Uh, what I didn't know when I started the book was how much of today's ugly political dialogue would reverberate through the decades. The reason that Crispus Attucks was established, the Indianapolis School Board in 1922 voted to have an all black segregated high school and mandated that the blacks in Indianapolis had to go to this new high school which was being built on the west side of town in the black section uh, near Indianapolis Avenue, where the famous black clubs were. You're over there. We're putting you over there. And the reason they did this was that coming into the city at that time were hordes of African-Americans from the South. The Great Migration, written in a book by Isabel Wilkerson, which far better than I could uh, ever write. Bill Russell's family went from Monroe, Louisiana. They happened to go to California. These people went to Texas. These people went here. Oscar's family was from Tennessee. They went to Indianapolis. They had some tacit connection through their mother's niece or something. They ended up in Indianapolis. There was uh, not joke Jim Crow laws. There was the possibility of economic opportunity. There was the possibility of educational opportunity. So wherever you today, you see the word migrants and overtaking the country, you can replace that word back then. That is exactly what was going on, that this idea of, uh, you know, they're overwhelming us, uh, they're overtaking us. Uh, that's what the problem was. So they built Crispus Attucks High School in 1922 against the wishes of the black community. We don't want just the black high school. We want to continue going to Broad Ripple High School and uh, uh, Tech Emanuel High School, all these great high schools in Indianapolis. Nope, your ass is going to Crispus Attucks. Well, what happened, Henry, was that uh, when the high school opened in 1927, it took five years to build it, that a bunch of African-American educators who were getting BAs and master's degrees at historically black colleges or once in a while, you know, an Ivy League school, they came and taught at Crispus Attucks because they had to get the public school money. Uh, at least that was mandated. They could screw Attucks in a number of ways, but they had to pay the teachers and they, could, they couldn't get money at white universities. And black, historically black universities couldn't pay what a, uh, a public school teacher was making in Indiana. So they had this unbelievable faculty. And they started churning out, uh, like there was a, a Tuskegee Airman came out of Christmas Attics, a couple generals, the first pol black police chief in Indianapolis, the first fire chief of Indianapolis, the first black state representative, tons of jazz musicians, uh, all these people. So they produced in a giant sort of fuck you to the idea that school was going to fail. The opposite happened. Now, they had some normal problems of public high schools, you know, and by the 1950s, things were becoming fraught. But then it became a kind of basketball story that uh, this coach, African-American coach named Ray Crow came along. He figured out how to play within the bounds of this decorum that you were supposed to, don't act too black, don't, you know, let's be, and they were, would win the sportsmanship award like all the time. At the same time, they started to kick everybody's ass. So it became this basketball story also. Oscar Oscar's a sophomore in 1953. 
53-54. They lose to Milan High School, which the you know the putative uh, Hickory High School in the movie. And then the next two years, 54-55, 55-56, they only lose one game. They just roll over everybody, including in 1955, a team from Gary Roosevelt that included Dick Barnett, you know, great Knicks player. Mm-hmm. And they were just this sort of basketball phenomenon that helped evolve the game in a state that was seminally important to the growth of basketball, which I also talk a lot about why Indiana was so important in the growth of basketball, which it unquestionably was. So I guess that must have answered your question since it took about 10 minutes of uh, talking. So <laughs> that was Crispus Attucks. The person Crispus Attucks was this sort of, I'm not going to say mythic because he was real. But Crispus Attucks was supposedly, I don't know who can completely document this, the first American to die in the Revolutionary War. He was present at the Boston Tea Party. There was a scuffle between a bunch of Americans. And Crispus may have been drinking with a bunch of other guys. And British militiamen shot, fired a shot. Crispus Attucks went down in the street. Those British militia, by the way, were later defended by John Adams. So uh, the the black they finally the school board allowed the black section of town to pick the name of the high school, and they picked Christmas Attics, which led everybody in the town to go, ha, "What a jo- who was who was this guy?" And I admit, had to look him up myself. <laughs> you know, he doesn't. He doesn't flow off the tongue, but considering what happened with the school, this almost uh, mythic success, you know, you know, rising from the ashes type of thing. Uh, it's a completely apt nickname. And probably today, 90 percent of the people who do know who Christmas Attic says knows it because of the because uh, of the high school. Yeah, that's why I know that phrase. Um, OK, let's take a quick break and then we're going to talk about Indiana. Um. Okay, here we go. In three, two, one. Okay, so Jack, uh, Indiana is kind of like like basketball heaven in the U.S., right? It's like you know, you and I are both lifelong basketball writers, and it's just this sort of people getting breathless tones about like where Larry Bird came from and this kind of stuff, right? Um, and the high school games, and obviously the movie Hoosiers is part of this, and that's always been kind of over here in my conscience. But then over here is like this is the home of the KKK, and there's some other part of American history that it's kind of fuzzy how those things connect, but you're, you're playing around in that space here in this book. You're exploring this a little bit. So talk me through it. How do those things connect? Well, one of the things that is extraordinary about basketball, well, you know, one of the, probably the number one thing is extraordinary is we actually know where it was invented. And we we're pretty, I know there's a couple, a couple Naismith, uh, Naysayers have come along, by the way. Have you seen oh, that? There's a town yeah. in uh, a town in uh, I think it's I can't remember what state it's in that's claiming, no, no, we invented basketball a year before. Anyway, we pretty much have it documented that this game was invented in 1891 in Springfield, Massachusetts, in December by this phys ed Christian educator named James Naismith. Well, what is amazing is how quickly that game grew. It is astonishing. And I couldn't go into it in the depth I wanted to, but this is 1891. Naismith puts up his peach baskets. By like two years later, you know, there's basketball leagues. And one of the places where, spelled by the way, basket space ball most of the time. (laughs) Well, there's some argument about who did it. But nevertheless, a couple of Naismith's Christian soldiers, YMCA people, took the game and went to Indiana. And I I have it in the book, but I think it's by 1893 or 1894. There's an account of basketball games in Indiana. And another place it happened was Kansas also, Indiana and and Kansas, partly Kansas because Naismith ended up going there to, to be a teacher. But anyway, So Indiana, as you've heard uh, before, was ideally suited 
to the game. You needed all kinds of do-it-yourself stories evolve. We put up an iron ring from the plow at the <laughs> barn. <laughs> we made a ball out of the hay that we smell. But <laughs> this was true. And this game, for whatever reason, this small town ethos that did grow the game in Indiana, no joke. Uh, by night, there's a state basketball tournament by like 1911. That's a really, really, really big thing. For some reason, it wasn't, you know, uh, football that caught on. It wasn't, I'm sure there's some great baseball players. It wasn't that. It was high school basketball. And it was, for the most part, a white sport. Um, the schools were largely white. Blacks were, uh, by law, uh, it could go to school. But many, many Blacks left the educational system when they were 13 or 14 because they had to go to work. So largely, this game grew in Indiana as a white game. And meanwhile, in another part of the country, almost I described that they were almost on parallel tracks. This Black game was growing, but it was being moved by the New York Wrens and, you know, teams like that. And obviously the, the Globetrotters also. So they kept on these kind of parallel tracks. There were scatterings of black players in Indiana because blacks did go to high school with whites, but there'd be one black for every, I, I this is not an exact figure, but let's say one black for every 100 white kids in the school. And in fact, the first Mr. Basketball in the state of Indiana was none other than George Crow, who was Ray Crow's, the coach of Christmas Addicts, his younger brother. George oh, wow. Crow was the first Mr. Basketball. George later went on. I basically knew him as a pinch hitter who used to uh, get up and hit a home run to kick the Phillies' ass in uh, in the 1950s. But uh, So there were black players, but it was a white game. And this rule by the Indiana State High School Athletic Association in one of the great catch-22 rules of all time ruled that segregated schools, that meant schools that were separated by race or religion, that meant Christmas Attics High School, Roosevelt High School in Erie, a couple other ones, there was, there was one in another town, and Catholic schools could not compete in the state tournament. Of course, the reason they were segregated was they were told they were segregated. So no black teams played in the high school tournament until the early 1940s, when this rule uh, was finally overturned uh, in the state of Indiana by the courts, by the way. It wasn't who, the good... Huh? Who sued? Who, who made that happen? A, a l bunch of lawyers. Uh, I'm trying to think who the exact sued, but they were uh, lawyers... One of them was a great lawyer named Robert Brokenburr, who was an African-American lawyer in Indianapolis. Uh, when Christmas Attics opened, they had gone to the offices of the State Athletic Association and said, you know, we opened this, uh, they opened this segregated high school. They made us go here. We certainly should still be able to play in the basketball. No, sorry, we can't have segregated schools. So... Finally, in the 1940s, it was overturned, but it took seven or eight, nine years before Ray Crow's teams in 1951. This is before Oscar. They had a great player named Halle Berry who went on to play with the Globetrotters. They had Oscar's uh, brother, who was named Flap Robinson. Robertson, that was his nickname because he flapped his wrists after a jump shot. He also flapped his gums more than uh, Oscar did. And uh, another guy named Willie Merriweather, who the, everybody said would have been as great as Oscar, but he had a shot with the Knicks, but he died uh, early of heart failure. Anyway, they started to make some noise. So when this happened, uh, it was a bomb. I mean, it was like, you know, Henry, you kind of fear what you don't know. And there were scores of white fans who had never seen a black person far less be it a game where the team is black, the coach is black, the fans are black, the cheerleaders are black, the pep band is black, 
And it was like, holy shit. I mean, this is really new. And they're so winning. Do, and they're winning. Yeah. And that's disconcerting a little bit. So it by the time Oscar comes, so Oscar was two years after that first great Addicts team. They didn't win the state championship or anything like that, but they made noise. And it was, okay, man, this is coming. Ray Crow's got some guys there. So Oscar's a sophomore in 1953. And so by now, the phenomenon, it's still a phenomenon, but we're getting used to the Addicts players. We're getting used to this team a little bit. And uh, then Oscar just takes this team and, you know, just pole vaults the game. Like one of the things you can do is you can YouTube uh, YouTube Christmas Addicts in the early 50s, Oscar Robertson, Indiana State basketball. It's not, and you can even get up the game where Milan High School won the state championship. Bobby Plump holds the ball for like four and a half minutes. <laughs> no way. He stands, there, he stands there like this, holding the ball. And I'm screaming at the thing, go double team them. You know, go, go double them. But they didn't do that kind of back then. So, Can you imagine the four and a half minute long movie scene if they had that in the movie? <laughs> just like just uh, un- unbelievable. <laughs> it really is, really is unbelievable. But to give Milan High School its due, I'm skipping around now. The year that they won it, we're talking about 53, 54. Oscar is a sophomore. Bobby Plump, who is represented by Jimmy Chitwood in the movie, they were completely different personalities, by the way. Jimmy Chitwood, you can't get to say a word. Bobby Plump. You can't get him to stop saying words. You know, great, great guy, great storyteller, terrific guy. Uh, anyway, Milan's team beats Oscar's team. And what that said to me was that something very interesting. It was sort of like, you know, Milan High School was represented as the essential underdog. That's the story of Hoosiers. There's a race background, but I do think it succeeds mostly on this idea of, and then, you know, David took his stone in the sling and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's certainly at the root of it. Well, to a large extent, the underdog in these stories is Christmas addicts. They are the new guy. The paradigm to winning the Indiana state basketball championship was not the big black scary team from the big city it was the kids who had learned to play together from the time they were in third or fourth grade and they knew everybody and they knew the coach and they went to school together that was the kind of team that won the state championship because when addicts finally beats roosevelt high all black roosevelt high from gary when they beat them in the state championship in 1955 they are not only the first all black team to win. They are the first team from Indianapolis. So oh, wow. all these years that the state tournament is going on, there are other high schools <laughs> in Indianapolis. There's Broad Ripple High School with great monumental high school. Kurt Vonnegut went to Broad Ripple High School. It's produced great athletes, great authors, a lot of different people. Um, they never won. You know, they a team from Indianapolis never won. And that's almost, in a way, uh, as extraordinary, but it speaks to the small-town ethos of Indiana basketball, which had, where we started this conversation, began way back in the uh, in the 1890s. So somehow every team is an underdog. What's that? Somehow every team is the underdog in this story, right? Like... Yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no behemoth, really. Like every, it's it's small teams that win every time. Definitely, I mean, yeah, addicts won because of what they had to overcome. I mean, they couldn't. There, I, I put in the book the number of times that they're uh, they they didn't have a gym to practice on. They're always on a bus. They're always on a bus. They're always eating bologna sandwiches on a bus. They don't. They're not sure where they can stop and eat. You know, they, they, they're they not sure whether they can go in there. So they finally just said, hell with it. You know, we'll eat on the bus. And it certainly created 
and you know every team, Henry, likes this, us against the world, Ben, nobody thought we could do it. <laughs> I saw LeBron said the other day, everybody wanted me to fail. I, I don't know. I don't remember that. I'm <laughs> Not <sure>. Nike. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought he was a cool guy from the beginning. I wanted him to <laughs> succeed and I had not. But that's, that is the ultimate team statement. Well, addicts certainly had that, although they ended up having their, you know, part of the story is how they, as was the case with many teams throughout, you know, history, galvanized their community. Suddenly the black car washes and the black laundromat and the black dentist could advertise in the addicts program. And uh, I, I do not have a dollar calculation of what it did to the, uh, to the community of the west side of Indianapolis, but it was a, you know, a major, major factor. And that's certainly part of the story. All right. Talk to me about this KKK thing, which is unpleasant, but we should get into it. Well, um, the KKK was at its height in the 1920s, and there was no place in America, this is not me saying, it's just the fact, that it was as strong as in Indiana. Uh, there were parades routinely with hundreds of thousands of people uh, in Indianapolis, uh, and the school board in 1922 that mandated the construction of Crispus Attucks High School was dominated by the KKK. So there was no doubt that KKK sympathies had to do with the construction of Crispus Attucks High School. That is why it was built a segregated high school. Weirdly, in 1926, this terrible leader of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan named Stevenson, gets into trouble with a murder, gets convicted, gets put away. And the KKK influence starts to go down. However, what remains is the mentality, this sort of genial, <laughs> genial racism. A great book that I depended on and went out to Notre Dame to interview the guys, a guy named Dr. Richard Pierce. He's a uh, historian at Notre Dame. He calls his book about Crispus Attucks and this whole era. It's not exactly about basketball, but the whole area of Indianapolis. He calls it polite protest. And he said that's sort of what was going on in Indiana. There wasn't, no, no, no. We, we love blacks. We embrace them. They can live here. There was subtle redlining real estate. Oh, no, no. Blacks are welcome to come to uh, school here. You know, no, no, no. There was this subtle mandate that you were going to school there. So it was kind of a polite kind of racism, which spoke to Indiana, which is a state. It's either called the northernmost southern state or the southernmost northern state. They definitely felt uh, fought for the union. There was not, uh, you know, mandated slavery. In Indiana, that was not what they were. They were a very much a northern state, but they were a northern state that had been populated from the south. And uh, so I'm not saying it was the only place in the country that was like this, but it walked this little bit of a fine line between being a southern state and a, uh, and a northern state. I, the first time I flew there, I got off. I mean, it's not that far from Canada on, on the map, right? <laughs> like it's... Yeah. Um, and uh, but I got the plane. I was like, "Oh, everybody has a southern accent here." Like, what is? <laughs> That's yeah, it's surprising. A, it's a... <laughs> you know, like... No, I mean, Larry had a you know, Larry Bird had kind of a you know, the ultimate sort of uh, twang, yeah, Hoosier accent. I mean, it, it was settled. Uh, again, I'm not don't want to present myself as a geopolitical expert, but it was it was settled from the south up. It wasn't just uh, African Americans who came to work there. A lot of people from North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, Virginia, because there were jobs there. There was industry in uh, Indianapolis. To a certain extent, it was a, uh, a healthy economy. It was sort of a, another Chicago in a way, a little bit uh, kind of like Chicago. So 
that's the way it was uh that's the way it was settled so have you uh or is it too early to talk about the movie that is notably going to be made about from this book oh, i i i wish <laughs> right right now i just uh hope uh people would uh would buy the uh would buy the book i you know the movie uh cert- yes certainly there have been some uh questions uh you know there has been some interest raised in that but uh that is above my pay grade as you know for journalists henry most things are above our pay grade they just don't <laughs> want our views on the movies that's not <laughs> yeah. how those conversations we don't that have is... the right clothes for those meetings you know like that's not yeah i'm looking down apparently not it looks like we have the same goddamn we thing on. We're wearing the same clothes. Which, We're both wearing a black, black t-shirt. long sleeve t-shirt yeah, yeah. that we got for free somewhere, probably. So. <laughs> That's right. What's wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's next? No, I don't know. I want to get back to my project of writing uh, a bad beach novel. That's what I... That's No basketball players. Not a fact in there. No fact. <laughs> Everything... Everything. It won't be werewolves or anything like that, but no, no actual facts. That's what I'm uh, looking forward to do. So, how far along is that project? At far, you know what we call the magical first draft is. Uh, it's kind of uh, far along. Every once in a while, my wife will look into my office and go, "Are you working on the novel?" I go, "Yeah." Oh, jeez. <laughs> why? Why? Why are you? Why are you bothering? You know, it's it's a uh, it's hard enough to get uh, any book published, but uh, a novel by a unknown novelist of uh, my age. But uh, who knows? I got to keep I got to keep plucking along on something, Henry. Then I'm rooting for you. That sounds like it's a real passion project. If your publisher and your wife don't want it and you're still all the way deep in the first draft, that means you are into this, Jack. That. Oh, no, I'm 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 into it. I need. uh I found I need something when I left daily. Well, of course I, you know, let's face it. SI, SI became daily journalism and you know, it, it never stops. When I started, it was weekly. It was weekly journalism. And now it's uh, daily. I don't miss that at all. Like 100%. I just do miss writing. I just miss writing, putting stuff on a page. And, uh, since every other hobby uh, a male could possibly do with handiwork or something like that, I ain't gonna be doing that. So I think I got to keep doing this. I gotta you got a knee it. for a knee for journalism. I think so. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, knee for writing. <laughs> All right. Well, I look forward next time. Let's talk about your beach book. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah, well, we'll see. I appreciate it, Henry. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, Jack. Talk soon. All right. Bye.